<clears throat> My name is Bob Darrell, and I am alcoholic. And only through the grace of a God that I was afraid to believe in that I've accessed and maintained in my life through a process outlined in a book entitled Alcoholics Anonymous, the ability to remain sponsorable and a persistent and consistent effort in our primary purpose of trying to forget ourselves and help other drunks. And consequently, I haven't had a drink since October 31st, 1978. And that is unbelievable for me. Um, and that remains the great miracle in my life because I was one of those kind of guys that could not stay away from it. And I would swear to myself time and time again and mean it. I know, because I'm not stupid. I get that I'm ruining myself. And I'd say that, I'd swear, sometimes sobbing uncontrollably how I'm never going to touch it again. And I would always go back to it. And I didn't, didn't understand what was happening to me. And uh, if you're new here, I... I want to welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous. I am surprised in this day and age how many people come to AA, stay for a while, and never put all their chips in the pot because they never fully concede to their innermost self that they have this thing. The first step is, is one of the most difficult things I've ever done truly inside here. Uh, it, it was so difficult, it almost killed me. I, and I was resistant, as I've been resistant to almost all of the 12 steps. There's something, it's, it's almost like this disease that wants me dead eventually and slowly creates this resistance to everything that will push it down and keep it at bay. And, and we all seem to have that to some degree. I, I mean, look, how much does the pen way when it's time to write a fourth step. Uh, you know what I mean? Right. right. I mean, you know, what, what is that? Isn't that weird? That's a weird deal. Uh, but that's, that's me. And I did, when it says in the beginning of, of chapter three that most of us have been unwilling to admit we were real alcoholics, that was so true for me. I don't want to be an alcoholic. I had uncles that were alcoholics. They were disgusting and pathetic and obnoxious. I don't want to be like that. I'll be anything other than an alcoholic. I'll, I was a wannabe rock star, so I'll be a drug addict because there were drug addicts that were professed rock, there were rock stars that were professed drug addicts. That, there was a little panache in drug addiction. I'll sign up for that. I'll sign up for being a mental health case because if you're a mental health case, you get pills and sympathy. I like both of those. I'm good for that. But I don't want to be an alcoholic. And the problem with that is, is that I am. And people who argue with the truth get sick. And I got sicker and sicker the more I tried to convince myself and anyone else that would listen to me how I'm not, I'm not an alcoholic. And I used AA to convince my, myself even more. As I would sit in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, what I, looking back, realizing I was sitting there suffering from alcoholism, even though I wasn't drinking anymore. And in the suffering from alcoholism and the depression and the, and the, and the oh, just feeling bad, I would sit there in this horrible condition. And I might be sober 30 days, 60 days. And I'd listen to the people in AA and I'd watch you and something became very apparent to me. Whatever's wrong with you is it's not the same thing that's wrong with me. Because look at you. I mean, you guys, you guys quit drinking and oh, you're, you're grateful for everything. Oh, just stop it, would you? I mean, I, I was sitting at a, a halfway, a skid row halfway house one time. I'd burnt my life to the ground. I hate myself. I hate what I've become. I'm so overcome with shame and remorse. And I would sit there as do-gooder members of AA would come in and rub my face in how wonderful their life was. <laughs> I remember sitting there thinking, this is hell. This is hell. But I, I didn't understand that I was comparing I was comparing my sickness in abstinence of untreated alcoholism against uh, some sort of pro program or recovery in your life. And I was coming up short. 
Of course I was. I never bought the whole package here. I, I, I wasn't really doing anything except not drinking. And I was very serious about that because I'm not stupid. I get it. But oh, that's all I'm doing is not drinking and going to some of these meetings, basically because I have to. And, but I don't like being made to go. So I, so I just will not listen. Um, punish you all for that. Um, <laughs> And so nothing changes, and, and um, I don't know what's wrong with me. But, you know, if you go to a lot of meetings, stuff starts seeping in. There's, you know, God talks to us in, the, in meetings about us. That's why I'm an everyday meeting guy. You know, there's a covenant here. I, I was sitting here before the meeting, and I could feel this thing that happens when a whole bunch of us get together for the purpose of recovery. The covenant is that God or will be in the midst. If, if you, I, I, would, I believe that if you could find a device that would measure the spiritual energy in all the individuals in this room and then me- measure the spiritual energy in the room, the whole would be greater than the sum of the parts. Because something else happens here when we come together. That's why God speaks to me in meetings often through this collective, this consciousness of the group. And I'm not the only one. I, that's why going to meetings is so important to me. Uh, before I ever understood the steps, before I ever did any of that, God talked to me here. I, I can't tell you how many dozens of times I'd be just messed up. I, I mean, I'm not doing well. And I'd go to some meeting and some stranger would have my my answer for me you know that's god and so i'm i'm I, it's important and i felt i felt it building in this room uh before the meeting and it was it's a nice thing and, but i don't know what it is to be alcoholic and these little things started leaking into me and, and i would i argue with i argue with what i hear here often one of the things people would start say, talking about was that we had a physical allergy to alcohol. No, I don't. I mean, I, I know about allergies. I got an allergy to cats. If I'm around cats, after about an hour, my eyes are watering. I might fill up with mucus. You know, I get, I get like, allergic reaction to, to cats. But I don't get that with alcohol. And then they, they'll, they'll tell you, if you say that to them, they'll, they'll try to say, well, you, you break out in a phenomenon of craving. No, I don't. And the thing about this allergic reaction to alcohol is it uses your own mind against you and you can't see it. I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room that's ever gotten in a lot of trouble from drinking. You know, where you just, you come to and, and you don't remember what you did, but somebody's waiting to tell you. <laughs> you know, what is that about? There's those people, they just get this glee out of telling the guys like me what we did the night before and it's never good you know i never i'm a blackout drinker i never did anything good in a blackout nobody came up to me the next day and said oh bob you were so helpful last night (laughs) no you you peed in our kitchen is what you did you know (laughs) hit on my wife you sideswiped my car you know you told everybody last night you beat bruce lee in a karate match (laughs) shoot me um, so I'd come to uh, time and time again and I'd, get, and I'd just be so disgusted with myself and afraid because I might have done something the night before that could have ended me up in prison for a bunch of years so I'm scared, I'm full of remorse and shame I, I just cringe when I think that people might know what happened last night and I, I swear to myself I, I, just, I can't let this happen again but I don't want to take drinking off the table because that would be a little extreme so i think to myself i got to go out and meet my buddies we're going to shoot a little pool maybe play a little music gonna have some fun i got to do that it's been a bad day i got need to unwind a little bit but i can't do what i did last night okay i'll go i'll have uh I'll have eight drinks. Eight sounds like a good number to me. Eight was a safe number. I never punched a cop on eight drinks. Eight's a good number. I feel comfortable with eight drinks. Okay, and I'm going out there with a feeling of security. Eight drinks is enough to get a nice buzz on, but it's not going too far. 
So I go into the bar to have the eight drinks. And if you've ever done something like that, it's a phenomenon that occurs when you get to seven. <laughs> it's like you awaken to the realization that eight was, eight was a bad number. It was, a, it was just a bad number. You know, like 12's a better number. And then 12 made it 15. And what I don't understand, I don't see the phenomenon of craving. To me, it looks like I just changed my mind, right? And that's the insidiousness of this disease. As, as I drink alcohol, I break out in this irresistible yearning for more, and it uses my own mind against me. And I don't see the cause and effect. I don't understand. I understand the consequences of my drinking, but I don't understand the momentary cause and effect. And yet... I, I've had that allergic reaction to alcohol my whole life. I look back, I tried, when I was 10, maybe eight, 10 years, eight, 10 years sober, I tried looking back over my drinking to find one incident, incident where I went out drinking and somebody had said to me, Bob, after maybe drinking for an hour, you'd think one time where somebody said to me, Bob, can I buy you another drink, where I said and meant it, no, you know, I'm good here. That's. <laughs> I couldn't find one moment where I ever had a feeling in drinking like, I've, this is just right. I've had just enough. <laughs> I never could. I couldn't get enough. And if you can't get enough, you're compelled to have too much. And so I started, uh, I started by failure, painful, demoralizing failure of fighting the bottle and failing. I started to understand. I couldn't have said the words phenomenon of craving or allergic reaction, but I started to understand that I have that thing that when I pick up a drink, it, that thing that happens to me, it always happens to me. If you're an alcoholic of my type, a chronic alcoholic, and you pick up a drink of alcohol, it's like having sex with a gorilla. You ain't done till the gorilla's done. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you can tell yourself, me and the gorilla are just going to have a dance. No, you're not. It's going to be bad. It's really bad. And, and, and I'm that guy. I, uh, and, and after all these failures to, to trying to control and enjoy my drinking and finally getting that I have that thing, I thought I was out of the woods. I th my ego has always fancied that it will find power in knowledge. And I think that knowledge that I must, must not take a drink, coupled with a sincere desire to change my life, I thought I was home free. And little did I know, I was entering into the most painful and most horrific years of my life. The life, the years when I knew to pick up a drink was the stupidest, most destructive thing I would ever do. And swearing to myself, I won't touch it again. And then six months later, I'm back at it. And I, there, there, there's a feeling of being out of control with that that is just hard to put into words. And I, I, my life is, is spiraling down the tubes and, and I, don't, I can't stop it. Because, but what I didn't understand and this almost killed me because it kept me from being all the way in in Alcoholics Anonymous. I understood that I have an abnormal reaction to alcohol. What I didn't get was that I have an abnormal reaction to abstinence. <laughs> and it is my abnormal reaction to abstinence that's driving me so insane and so lonely and depressed that I eventually just start yearning for the effect of five or six drinks, even though it somehow along the years, as, it, as it, the disease progressed, it's turned on me. And now when I drink the last couple of years, I don't get free anymore. I don't, I, I don't drink now. In the beginning of my drinking, I drank and I got free. I mean, I could come out and play. I could talk to people. I could laugh. I, I mean, it was, it was magical. But somewhere over the years, just... It, incrementally it just got the, that fun and effect just seemed to bleed out until at the end the last couple of years i drink in depression i i drink sometimes and grow on crying jags i drink in this horrible horrible loneliness and i don't understand what's happening to me 
because I start to I go to get drunk with an excited anticipation of relief and fun and freedom and I can't jump start the effect anymore and I don't know why I don't know whether I'm in the grip of a progressive illness that eventually drives guys like me to try to take their own life um, because the only thing that made life worth living is, is, is bled out now and I can't, I can't get that, that ease and comfort anymore I can't get that effect and I don't know what's wrong with me because it doesn't look like alcoholism my, my mother was a therapist and, and I, she even through her help and the, the help of some people I went through a long term treatment center I got, went to school took some classes, got certified I, I became a substance abuse counselor for a period of time because I think there's power in knowledge and there's power in, in position and I, I was actually very good up to the day they fired me for being drunk and on the job I mean, <laughs> But I could, I could tell you all the nuances of my emotions and stuff. Um, um, so people, people are coming to me, and they're trying to help me. A lot of people try to help guys like me until we, ex- we exhaust all of them, and then they all give up, and there's nobody trying to help me at the end. Nobody cares anymore. My, my mother, when I, when I was a year sober, I made my first pass at amends to my parents. It took them a year before they'd have anything to do with me. And my first passive amends, my, my mother during that, she broke down and she started crying because she confessed to me that she used to just wish and, and pray that I would die and just make it stop. All right? My mother loved me. And I would tell you how I never hurt anybody except myself. And so I started going to the, I went to a lot of therapists. I, I've done so, so much stuff. I was hypnotized. I, did, I primal screamed. I, I, um, I did rational emotive therapy with, El, with Ellis, the guy who founded it. I, I did uh, transactional analysis. I did gestalt therapy with, a, with one of the guys who studied under Fit, Fritz Perls and Alan Watts. He was a brilliant guy. The best. The top of the food chain for human aid. I'd been, had been given many diagnoses and, and all kinds of treatments, including various medications, hoping to balance one side of this horrible equation. See, there's two sides to it. The one side is if I could just alter my drinking to get it back to the way it was when I was 18 years old again. Oh, oh. If I could do that and ha- get the fun back, oh, my God. I'd, I'd be, in my alcoholic, I'm willing to go to jail regularly just to get that. I mean, like, you know what I mean? I, I, I'll do anything to get that. But I can't. I failed. And I'm trying to, through therapy and various medications and things, I'm trying to balance the other side of the equation, what happens to me when I'm sober. Because i got a big secret. And the big secret is uh, without something, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I, I don't. I'm not like you people. I'm, I I get sober, man. I don't fit anywhere. I'm depressed all the time. I, I I just I get sober, and I was I thought I got this about I was about two years sober, three years sober. Man, I was just, that that movie Alien had come out, right? And there's a scene in there where this this creature jumps out of this guy's chest and attaches itself to this guy's face, right? And, and he's, it's like right there. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, that's what happens to me when I stop drinking. I get me right here. Only it's me that jumps out of my chest and gets right here with my future and my feelings. And, 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 and you know, people say, how you doing, Bob? I'm <laughs> just hanging in there. You know, I, I'm, so, I'm, so, it, I'm so locked up inside of me. And the obsession to drink when it returns, it doesn't return looking like i, I got to have a Budweiser. It returns in a yearning for freedom. Like, I just want to get free. I I just got to get this up off of me. I got to get me up off of me. I got to get these fears and these anxieties and this shame and this remorse. I got to get it up off of me. And I can't will it away. And 
I, did, I, I didn't know. I thought it was a mental health issue. I didn't understand that this is alcoholism. This is chronic, because uh, this, this is not a drinking problem. I have a drinking problem when I drink, but I have a more serious problem once I'm sober. And I didn't understand that. And, and well-intentioned people had been telling me for years things about me, you know. And, and if you're new here, I'm sure over the past several years, you probably have had the same experience that I had, where people are getting in your face trying to tell you stuff about you. Maybe your mother and father have had conversations with you about you. Maybe your kids, maybe your mate, maybe your, your boss, maybe your, your minister or clergy. Maybe your parole officer. It, they use different words, but it's the same conversation. They're kind of saying, Bob, Bob, you're really, Bob, you're screwed up. And you catch me on a bad day when my defense mechanisms are down. I'll go, yeah, I know, I know. And they'll go, you know why you're screwed up? And I just, I don't know, man. I've been to so much therapy. I've had so many diagnoses. I have no idea anymore. The more I tried to analyze myself in therapy, the more confused I was about who I was. I don't know. And they'll tell you. Well, the reason you're so screwed up is you keep getting screwed up. If you didn't get so screwed up, you wouldn't be so screwed up. So I'm pretty screwed up. I think, okay, I'm not going to get screwed up. And when I don't get screwed up, I get so screwed up, I got to go get screwed up. And it doesn't make sense. And somebody's getting in my face saying, you know, you're pretty screwed up. Oh, yeah, I know. Oh, yeah, I know. Because I don't understand that for all practical purposes, my alcoholism starts where the bottle ends. And I don't know that. I have a twofold thing. In the beginning of uh, we agnostics, uh, Bill says, if, if you have these two things, it says, if you find when you honestly want to, you cannot quit entirely. Well, what do they mean by entirely? It sounds a little extreme to me. I mean, I mean that's kind of crazy, isn't it? And they meant entirely. And I can't quit entirely. I can do what my sponsor calls changing deck chairs on the Titanic, changing from one thing to another, but I can't quit entirely because without something, I'm nothing. Or if when drinking, you have a little control over the amount you take, I've always been that guy. I, it's odd that I've always been that guy and didn't know I was that guy. There's a test in the big book. Some, maybe some of you are sitting here and you don't think you're alcoholic. Maybe you think, well, my problem is I got arrested for heroin. It's probably really heroin. You want to find out if you're alcoholic? They ask you crazy questions in the treatment center, like, what's your drug of choice? That's a dumb question. What they should ask is, what happens to you when you start drinking, Bob? Could you, could you pass the test? The test is, and I, I, I started recommending this a few years ago. I think it's a good test. I think, I think we're better off knowing the truth. It says you're not sure. If you're an alcoholic, you, you think these people in A are full of crap about this phenomenon of craving. I don't have that. Go find out. It's good information. Go over to the nearest bar, have two drinks, and then stop abruptly. And if you're going to have two, you, you're like me. You, you're going to have doubles. Two doubles and then stop <laughs> abruptly. I mean, if you're only going to have two, come on, let's go, you know, two doubles. 100 proof doubles and stop abruptly. And, okay, I'm going to go into this bar and I'm going I'm to take the test to prove those people in AA wrong. I don't have this allergic reaction to alcohol. I'm not a, I don't have a, I don't, I don't have that. And a funny thing would happen. I'm going to go in there, I'm going to have two drinks, and that's it. As I'm starting the second drink, I will, it, it, it's almost guaranteed that I will realize that this is a bad test day. <laughs> because that game is on, I didn't know that game was on. <laughs> that girl. I, I think that's my soulmate. <laughs> Got to have a drink with her. Bad test day. Tomorrow would be a bad, better test day. And what I don't realize is as the effect of the alcohol hits me, it uses all my abilities to rationalize and justify, to get behind whatever makes perfect sense to me why it's okay to have one more drink. 
And this disease punked me out like that for years, and I didn't know it. I didn't know it. And then Silkworth says, guys like me, when we quit drinking, I start to get sick. He, he says that I become restless. Boy, do I get that. I've, I've had this thing about me every time I get sober where I just, I just don't feel settled anywhere. I have this vague feeling I can't put my finger on as if I need to be somewhere else. Now, if you ask me, where is that? I don't know, but it's not here. <laughs> I, I'm restless. I'm irritable, but I don't know I'm irritable. And I don't want to be irritable because irritable people irritate me. <laughs> I'm not irritable. What I am is a guy who, when I quit drinking and the fog lifts, I just can see how stupid people are. <laughs> it's a gift. And oh my God, I never knew that the world was so full of stupid people. I work with stupid people. They were nice when they interviewed me, but now that I've been there a couple of weeks, there's some stupid people there. Go to the, go to traffic. Oh man, there's some stupid people in traffic. I'll tell you. Go to a, and they make you go to AA meetings. Oh my God, they got the stupid people grouped in AA. <laughs> AA to me was intellectually offensive. I'm an atheist, or I'm a wannabe atheist. I'm not really an atheist. I've known some real atheists. You have to be very religious about your atheism to be a good atheist. <laughs> what I am is a guy who's afraid of God. I'm a guy who, if I just suspect you don't like me, I'm going to not like you first. <laughs> and so I, I, I get, I, you, you start talking about God, it's like a steel door slams in my head. I judge you. I judge you harshly. I don't understand that the truth is I feel so bad about myself that I, I'm almost desperate to pull everybody else down, hoping, hoping that it'll level the playing field, that I won't feel this icky stuff. Because I'm an alcoholic. Take away the alcohol and all I got left is the ick. <laughs> right? And so I'm, I'm irritable, but I don't know it. Oh, God, people really used to bug me in A meetings. You ever had someone in AA, you're newly sober, you just burnt your life to the ground, you hate yourself, you hate everybody else too. I mean, you, I'm an equal opportunity hater. I just like, I don't like nothing, right? Do you ever have some, on a day like that, do you ever have somebody come up to you and say, has anyone told you today they love you? <laughs> I hate that. You know, I don't know what the answer is, but you know a hug's coming and I don't, don't touch me. Don't touch me. Oh, God, I hate that. Oh, and then oh, you, all this happy, clappy, gratitude, God stuff in AA. Oh, my God, it was horrible. 1978, uh, I came to, I'd been sentenced by a judge to two years in prison. And then he did something that was actually very kind. He gave me sort of a chance. And he said, uh, you're st we're committing you, but we're going to stay the commitment. I didn't know what that meant. And what that meant was he, if I went into this place called the Ark House, which is kind of, it was the only place that the, the PO department could find that would take me because I'd been in all the other places. And this was, this is not a nice rehab. This is like the bottom of the food chain for rehabs. They housed about 200 homeless guys or guys out of prison and guys like me. Low bottom, end of the road kind of guys. And, and he said, if you go in there and stay a year, get good you, your analysis reports, good uh, PO from your parole officer reports, good uh, make the restitution, all that stuff. And after a year, you come back here and it'll be time served misdemeanor. But if you don't do all that stuff, kid, it's automatic. You're doing two years. And so I went into this place with a determination and I can't stay sober. I'm like a mule in a hailstorm when it comes to abstinence. I can hunker down and take it for a little while. But eventually, I just get it up to here with these emotions and this loneliness 
this depressive loneliness that I always seems to smack me in the face after I'm sober a little while and the shine is worn off of, of everything I'm going to do now that I'm sober. Because I'm, I'm one of those kind of guys. I'm going to do. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm like an engine that won't turn over. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to. Right. And when I'm going to get drunk is what's going to happen. And I, and I got drunk. Eventually, I couldn't take it anymore. And I'd get thrown out of there because I'm one of those kind of guys. I can't hide it. Every once in a while, this is so crazy. I, once, I run into people in AA that they come out of the closet and they say, I've been going to meetings every day and secretly drinking for three years. I look at them and think, how'd you do that? <laughs> I take a drink. Everybody knows Bob screwed up. You know what I'm saying? I can't hold, I can't hide that. That phenomenon of craving just kicks my butt, man. I can't, I can't, I don't understand how you could do that. So I, I pick up a drink. I can't, I'm drunk, 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 drunk. And I get thrown out of there and I'm in the park and I come to the next day and I'm sick. I don't even know if it was the next day. It might have been, it, it might have been three days later. I don't know. I don't, I don't really know. But I'm in, it's a fog, and I, but one, this one day I come to, and, and I'm shaking, uh, and I'm, I'm sick, and alcohol doesn't work anymore, and there's no more fun in it, and I get it. I, I get the truth that the party's over. I can drink until I pass out. I can drink till it kills me, but I can't get free anymore. And I, I was sitting there, and I'd had a physical the year before, and this doctor, because I thought I had a brain tumor, but he gave me the whole physical thing and told me, you don't have a brain tumor, kid. You have alcoholism. And if you keep drinking, it's going to kill you. But I'm a young kid in my 20s. He said, but you're young enough and physically you bounce back quick enough, it might take five more years. And I came to that morning in that park, and I'm so sick, and I'm so done. I can't do this anymore. And I, I thought of that five more years of this and something just snapped inside me and I make the decision to kill myself. I would rather, get, escaping the, the, the hopelessness and the anguish of who I've become through death seemed like a good deal to me because I can't drink it away anymore. And I went to a bridge to take my own life and I couldn't kill myself because I'm a coward, basically. And I ended up in a meeting. I ended up in a detox in Las Vegas, two two thousand miles away, through a bizarre series of circumstances that had the that had God's DNA all over it, all over it. How I got there? Oh, it's just crazy stuff, coincidental, synchronistic stuff that brought me to Las Vegas, which is crazy. If I'd have made, if you'd have said in Pennsylvania, make a list of a hundred cities you might get sober in. <laughs> Las Vegas wouldn't be on that list. Are you kidding me? We, that's the hitting bottom capital of the world, man. That's, people come to Vegas to drink themselves to death. I'm not going to get sober there. But we are brought together by divine appointment. And it was exactly where I, God wanted me. And I was in this detox, and I, I sat there, and I'm so demoralized. It, it was the first time I could listen to you. And I'd been around alcoholics. I'd probably been to 150, 200 meetings in various institutions, county jails, detoxes, treatment centers, halfway houses. But I could never hear you because I'm too full of me. And I had just enough of me kicked out of me that I could, I could hear you. And your experience washed over me and just and started to shift my world. As I sat there and did the most important thing a guy like me could ever do, I sat there and started to nod my head. And started thinking, my God, I'm like these people. And I heard this man talk about a suicide attempt. And I had just done that. And I knew he's not, he didn't read this crap in a book. He was there because I was just there. And he talked about the emotions. And he talked, oh, man, he's, I'm sitting thinking, oh, my God, I'm like this guy. And I, I did something that is so out of character for me. I went up to this man who, who he, he looks, he's really clean cut. I have like long hair and a beard. I'm like left over from Woodstock or something, you know. And, and, I, and this is like a straight square dude, right? But he touched me. He, I connected with him. And I went up to him and I did something that was so out of character. I said, 
I was afraid. I remember I was shaking inside as I asked him. I said, would you sponsor me? And then I had to say, I'll do anything you ask me to do. And I had no idea that they actually had a lot of things they wanted you to do. I mean, I, I was just being nice, you know. I mean, oh, my God. They had a whole bunch of stuff they wanted you to do. And none of it seemed like a good idea until after you do it. He wanted me to go to a lot of meetings because he knew God would talk to me there. He wanted me to do service, 12-step work, right away. I mean, I, I tried to argue. With, I, I don't argue with him, but I tried to explain to him that, <laughs> that I understood why he wanted me to do 12-step work. But, you know, I'd had a lot of therapy. So I said to him, I said, yeah, but, you know, I know what you're saying, but don't you think I should work on me for a while? And he rears back and he says, work on you. You've done quite enough of that. Stop it. <laughs> when he said that, I thought, I thought, wow, I have done quite enough of that. I mean, if I could have been fixed, I'd have been fixed by now, for God's sakes. <laughs> and I just started, he, he walked, started walking me through some frightening amends, like contacting the courts and offering to do the two years. and Things that if I would have been full of myself and my own self-reliance and I would have been on top of my game, I would have never, ever done but him and the other members of AA took advantage of my brokenness and my weakness and got me to do some things that under other circumstances I never would have done. And my world started to change. I was three months sober, and I went to my home group, which was the, at that time was a big book study, Friday nights. And I used to, go, I used to get there. I've been taught to go to meetings early. So we get there an hour early, you know, talk to people and do all that stuff and help with the chairs and and I'm there, and my counselor in the detox that I ended up in was, an, like a lot of people who work in the field, she was an intermittent member of AA. But she came to that meeting that night, and she knew everything about me. Judy, she, Judy just died this last year, too. Anyway, Judy knew everything about me. She was, I was in there for th over 30 days, and she had my case history. She knew about all the treatment centers, all the therapy, all the medications. She knew about everything. And she pulls me aside after the meeting, and she said to me, Bob, what happened to you? And I don't know what she means. I said, uh, Judy, I don't what do you mean? She said, no, what happened to you? I said, Judy, I don't know what you're talking about. She said, she said I heard you got a sponsor, Dick T. I said, yeah, I did. I, I call him every day. He's a good man, good for you. Every time I'm leaving work, you're one of the guys bringing the meetings into the detox. I said, yeah, I, I do that a couple times a week. She said, I, I heard you signed up for the meetings and the, they're starting in the state penitentiary. I said, yeah, I, I did. She said, I heard you contacted your mother and father and are trying to make amends. Yeah, it's not going well. <laughs> uh, she said, good for doing that. She said, I, I, I heard you're uh, the secretary of an AA group over at the Alano Club. I said, I am. I'm not supposed to be. I'm, I'm not six months sober, but they voted me in anyway. <laughs> she said, I heard you're praying. I was embarrassed when she said that. I said, yeah, yeah, I am. I don't know if I believe in God. And I'm going, yeah. <laughs> and then she said to me, what happened to you? You never did all that stuff before. And I thought, my God, I never did. I'd been around AA for over a half dozen years. And all I ever did was go to some, a couple meetings and try not to drink. But I'm, somehow, something had pushed me out of the group I was in that was dying of alcoholism. Talks about it, chapter 5. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely, which I think is more than half, completely give yourself to this simple program. I was part of that group for a half dozen years, dying in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous. And somehow, I'm, now I'm in the middle of AA. And I thought to myself, what, hap what did happen to me? Because my last drunk was not the worst one. I'd had, if, if, if you were going to be catapulted into recovery and the actions of recovery by a horrific drunk, there was earlier ones that should have done that. This was not the worst. It was just the, it was just the one. And I didn't understand what had happened to me. And there was, 
you know, when you're, when you're new and you come off the streets and you have nothing, people in Alcoholics Anonymous, if, you, if they know that you want help, man, it's, it comes at you. We're a funny group. If you come to meetings and you, you, and you kind of act like, leave me alone, we will. I mean, there's always one guy who got off his meds that won't. But for the most part, for the most part, we, you want to be left alone, we, leave, we respect that. Matter of fact, I tell the guys in the detox, if you think I'm a jerk, I respect that. And they do. But if you ask for help, oh, my God. People in A are all over it. People used to come to the halfway house and give me rides to meetings and throw a pack of cigarettes at me every once in a while. And, and one, guy, one guy came up to me after a noon meeting, and he said, I need some help. I said, what do you need? He said, come, come with me out to my car. And he opened the trunk of his car, and he had sport coats and slacks and dra- nice shirts and stuff in there. That, and they all just come from the dry cleaners. And here's what he said to me. This is very clever. He said, my wife is really on my case to get rid of this stuff. Could you help me out and take it off my hands? <laughs> she wasn't on his case to help. He just knew that I would take it if he presented it like that. And I didn't get pushed into Alcoholics Anonymous by the consequences of my drinking because I'll roll with those no matter how bad they get. I will, I will some, when Silkworth says to us, our alcoholic, our alcoholic life seems the only normal one, I will bend my mind around stuff and make the most horrific things seem like normal. I mean, and I bet you I'm not the only one in this room that's ever done it. Do you ever drink so much beer that you pass out and wet the bed? The first time you do that, that's horrible. Three weeks, three years later, you start learning if you keep flipping that mattress, you get it even yellow after a while. I mean, it's like we, it's inconvenient, it's terrible, but it becomes the new normal for us, which is kind of pathetic when you think about it. Go go to a, go to a, uh, go to some social organization and present that as a way of life. See how many people sign up for that. But to us, it becomes like a normal, it's the new normal. And... I didn't quit drinking because of consequences. I quit drinking because I got it in my innermost self where I really live. Not up here where you you analyze stuff and the chatter exists. But I I fully conceded to my innermost self. I've done everything there is to do except AA. Isn't it odd that a guy like me could be around Alcoholics Anonymous for six years and never really do this? And don't know that I don't do it. When I stood on that bridge trying to get up enough courage to take my own life, if you would have asked me if I'd ever tried AA, I probably would have said, yeah, it doesn't work for me. But I never did it. Because it doesn't make sense to me. And, and I'm not alone in this. If, you, if, you ever, if, you're, if there's anyone brand new here and you just burnt your life to the ground and you look at the 12 steps, they do not look like something that's going to help you. You know, that's, they look kind of creepy, actually. You know, I mean, really. I mean, if you're like, I need a set of steps like step one, make Bob's police record disappear. That's a good step. You know, step two, bring her back properly ashamed of herself. That's a good step. (laughs) Step three, make my parents realize how wrong I was and so they'd start turning on the the money flow again. (laughs) Step four, give me a thousand bucks. (laughs) Instead, we have turn your will and your life over to the care of God. (laughs) Oh, stop it. I'd rather get a lawyer. <laughs> and, and the amends step, I, oh, the amends horrified me. But sometimes we get lucky. And lucky when it comes to alcoholism is often very painful. In our book, it talks about before you ever work a step, before you ever believe in God, before you ever trust your sponsor, before you ever believe your sponsor, before you ever believe in AA, it says we will come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of our life as we had been living it. I believed that. I lived that. I was that. And then it says you're at a point now where there's nothing left 
except to pick up this simple kit of spiritual tools that were laying at your feet. And I'd been, you've been laying at my feet for years, and I keep jumping over them to get what I want because I don't want transformation. I want ease and comfort. I want self gratification. I want all, I want, I want. Half the time, I don't know what I want, but I want. And this time, uh, through just through a lack of alternatives, I, I'm in a trap I cannot spring. Drinking has become horrible. And not drinking feels like I'm doing time, and it's horrible. And it's either AA or the next time I will find the courage to kill myself because there's nowhere for me to go here. And that is what brought me to Alcoholics Anonymous, and it keeps me here. But I have a, I have a quick forgetter, so to renew that in me, I work with a lot of guys. I'm always doing 12. I, I, every once in a while, I get to a point where all the guys I sponsor are low maintenance, they're all sponsoring a bunch of guys, and they're all doing really well. I, and when that happens... They don't have the juice to relieve me of the bondage of self that new people do. You know, and then I start getting self-involved again. When, when the fog of self comes down over you, if you're like me, you need a, a seeing-eyed newcomer to pull you out of the fog, man. I, you know what I'm saying? And so I'm always looking for new guys. And I always need one or two that's so crazy that, that when the phone rings and you see it's them, you go, oh, oh. Oh, hello. <laughs> and and, you, if you, and you ask them, how you doing? <laughs> 30 minutes later, they're still telling you. <laughs> but for that 30 minutes, I'm free. I'm, it's tedious, but I'm free. And I'll walk, I'll walk away from a phone call like that or, or dropping a guy off at the halfway house after spending a couple hours with him and I'll, I'll feel a rightness in my life. And I think the, the rightness comes from fulfilling what my divine purpose is. You know, I came around Alcoholics Anonymous for a lot of years. And uh, there was a lot of happy people in AA. Most of them, I hated you for being that way. But there were people, and there were some of the old timers that, not all the old timers, there were some old timers looked like they needed a drink, but there were some old timers <laughs> that, that walked through life with like what appeared to be a confidence, as if they knew exactly who they were. There was no mystery. They knew what their life was about. They knew what their purpose was. It was like there was just a, a, a divine rightness about them. And there was. Because I have that in my life today. I know who I am. My name's Bob Darrow, and I have the disease of alcoholism. And I know what my purpose is. It is my primary purpose. It comes before me. And that's not easy when you're a self-obsessed self-centered, clamoring for self kind of guy. But it doesn't matter that I'm that way. It only matters that I take the actions of Alcoholics Anonymous, that I go to my commitments. I stick my hand out to the new people. I, pay, I answer the phone no matter, even, oh, I know he's going to talk for 30 minutes about her again. It doesn't, I can think all of that as long as I say, hi, how you doing? Right, or I pick them up. I go get them and pick them up and take them to my home group. And as long as I take the actions, the great Frank Honeycutt, who died with over 45 years, said, "AA is not for those who need it." And that's really true. We all know people that are dying of this disease. That God, they need this, but they don't get it, do they? And Frank said, "It's not even for those who want it." And you'd think it would be for those who want it, but it's not. Across from the detox I go, there's an old oak tree, and they had to take the stones out from around the tree because people died there in convulsions, banging their heads against those stones, hoping to get a bed, waiting to get a bed because the detox was full. 
and I've, I've stopped on my way in to take a panel in there, and I've talked with some of those people over the years, and they've told me, sobbing, with tears of sincerity, how much they want this thing. But they don't get it. Because Frank said, it's not for those who need it, and it's not for those who want it. It's only for those who do it. So if you're sitting here and you don't feel like doing this thing, that's really good. <laughs> if you take the actions against your feeling, you're gonna, it's going to have like a, you're going to put torque on your spiritual growth. I'm telling you, you'll be rocketed into the fourth dimension. It's, it's, if, you, if you take to this thing easily, it's fine. It's great. It'll change your life. But I love the guys that are like me that resist this stuff. <laughs> You know, because it just, because when they finally break through the resistance, it's like, pew. Some of the best members of Alcoholics Anonymous that I know fought this thing for a long time. And I understand that. It is my nature to fight this thing. But I, somewhere along the line, I stopped fighting it. And I started, I surrendered. And when we talk to you, if you're new, and we talk to you about surrender, all we want you to do is join us. Stop fighting it. Stop arguing with it. Stop analyzing it. Just do it. And those that do it, get it. And those that don't, don't. So if you're new, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. I got good news. And I got bad news. <laughs> the good news, and I'm not trying to sell you anything. Believe me, I am not. What I found in AA is the only effective treatment for the thing that was secretly wrong with me that drove me so insane I would eventually drink again. The bad news is that the treatment here doesn't take as fast as five shots of tequila. But it will take it just the same. Thanks for listening.